right, so we are back. Uh, today is myself, Mike, and Brian talking about the Great Depression and the influence it has on today's world. So Brian and I had a really interesting pre-show talking about the different, you know, really it was around all sorts of different political and technological influences around the Great Depression. And I'm really excited about this show because the Great Depression is one of those events in history that is far enough back to be a bit of a mystery to many people, myself included, who really are living through the third wave of generations that have been influenced by it. You know, my grandmother was a child during that time, and it was really her parents who lived through it. And it still ripples into the world today through the influences of not just the policies that were put into place, the laws, the regulations, the subsidies, etc., but also the culture, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, how banks should perform, how the government should intervene, uh, and all sorts of understandings that we have about how to look at the economy as a sign of growth whether it's the unemployment rate, the uh, inflation, the job creation, all sorts of things that we look at today as a means to judge how are we doing, you know, how is the economy doing? And that's a topic that frequently gets brought up in conversation, you know, as you go anywhere, really, uh, uh, the conversation of the economy is almost as pervasive as the weather. People comment on, oh, yeah, things are going really well, or, ooh, you know, things are crashing. It's kind of a scary place. And sometimes I try to imagine what it would be like during the Great Depression, to just imagine the feeling of fear that is widespread throughout society, especially in New York City at the time, where really the banks were rejecting people and you couldn't get access to your money. And not that long ago, we were talking about, we were talking about this pre-show, not that long ago in 1850s or so, Ireland suffered from the potato famine where one out of eight people died, you know, over a million people on this island. And you picture that distance in time was only 65 years or so. Maybe it was, it was even, it was less time than it is right now in 2019 from the Great Depression as it was from the potato famine to the Great Depression. So it's, it's topical. And at the time, the government wasn't providing too many resources. I mean, relative to what it looks like after the Great Depression, where food subsidies started to become a reality. And every policy is introduced on its face as having a benefit to society in, in a massive way. The One of the challenges, not to say it's the only one in regulations like this, though, in, in the case of food subsidies, is that over time, the need to provide ubiquitous food is no longer a, a top consideration. So phasing out some of those policies are pretty critical, whether it's healthcare, whether it's military, whether it's food subsidies, whether it's economic policies. These things, it's critical, I think, for society to relook at these things and understand the origin of where they come from. Because just because something exists, a policy, a regulation, a belief does not mean it benefits society today and that it should continue to exist. And so the inspiration for this conversation really is to understand the origin of how ideas were introduced into society and prompt a little question mark as to whether they're still worthy of our uh, appreciation and, and continuing the support of these of these programs. So throughout our conversation, we'll introduce various uh, topics of uh, regulation of, of notable events throughout the Great Depression, but overall keeping a consistent theme of understanding the origin of this time period and how it influences the world today. So with that introduction, uh, Brian, I know you were uh, really interested in the technology influence. So whether it's the telegraph and to the telephone and thinking about how information and ideas spread across society uh, has a huge influence on the rate of change of the economy. And it's, uh, it, it's really interesting to think about that because it's so much different than life today. When you just grab your cell phone and tweet something out and everyone can see it, back then, the, the, how many households had access to a telephone? 30, 40 yeah, percent? It was probably 40 percent in the 1920s. Yeah, so so relatively very few. And I mean, at that point, too, you also have to pay money to use it. There's long distance phone calls. You're not just getting on and, and chatting with people for hours. So uh, it is the early, earliest stages of this. 
Exactly. I mean, we could actually see a chain of connections that start, uh, let's say, 1844, um, where I believe the beginning of decentralized communication started to, to take its, uh, its uh, first steps. Um, that started with a centralized form of communication called the telegraph, uh, more or less invented in 1844. Uh, rapidly, rapidly started getting deployed uh, trans uh, uh, coastally. Um, I would say just around the mid 1850s, uh, we had uh, more or less uh, wired up uh, from coast to coast. Obviously, smaller towns and hamlets didn't get that uh, until a little bit later. First transatlantic um, uh, telegraph company was uh, about 1858. So let's say by 1860, we were connecting the world via a communication system that heretofore was impossible. It was an instant form of communication. It used an arcane language and it was centrally uh, distributed, uh, meaning you had to have access to a telegraph, uh, a telegraph company, and that telegraph company had to be willing to transmit your information. Very important to understand that. Um, because this that, was this was still uh, sixty five years or so before the Great Depression. Exactly. So I'd imagine but these the, roots are yeah hugely influenced on how the telephone lines got wired. Well, more than that, it, it had an influence on uh, exclusivity of information. Uh, most of the speculation within stock markets come from the idea that somebody or groups of individuals have access to information that others don't. We may deem that in some ways inside or outside information. Uh, you know, that, that, that is always a shifting, uh, shifting bit of um, uh, analysis. Uh, today, one could almost say that for almost 40 years, certain individuals had access to information that others didn't, and that is today deemed insider information. So that being said, um, a, a group of individuals became exceedingly wealthy because they were able to have access to records about what's going on in Europe, um, you know, what's going on on certain farms, uh, commodity prices, things like that. That information would sometimes take weeks to surface and and then investors would invest and then the common person would find out maybe months later with the telegraph it happened instantaneously and so those that had access to the right people and the right information and sent it via the telegraph grew immensely wealthy leading up to the industrial revolution turn of the century 1900s to the 1920s the average person started realizing just around 19 right after World War One, that a lot of folks got wealthy based upon knowledge that they had about the possibilities of a particular stock exploding. And um, they realized that, you know, their nine to five job, their inability to get out of their rut could be solved if they could only do what these wealthy individuals that they've read about in books and newspapers uh, and, and were able to act on that information. Simultaneous to this was the rise of the telephone. Um, the, the, you know, Alexander Graham Bell was laughed at when the telephone was invented. Um, in fact, the first telephone call took place on this day in 18, uh, what was it, 1876. So today on 1876, yeah, March Alexander 10th. Graham Bell yep, uh, said, Watson, come here, I want to see you, in his, uh, in his uh, Scottish accent over a, um, essentially a short telephone line. Okay, that, so, started, that started yeah. a revolution in communication. That is a decentralized form of one-to-one -one communication. And anybody who studied the internet and where we are today can appreciate what this essentially means. Um, the telegraph companies were having none of this. They thought Mr. Bell's invention was rude and very crude, that he would allow commoners to be able to speak to each other via these wires. Their 
they were the technologists who had priesthoods that were in control of the information and control of the flow of the information. And they had arcane languages. They'd already been around, you know, some 30, 40, 50 years. And they were not going to allow this upstart bell to allow people just to talk directly to each other. So his investors actually told him that you really can't work on this telephone thing. He actually did it in secret. Uh, he was supposed to be working on something called the harmonic telegraph, which allowed you to send more digital, quote unquote, digital information down the telegraph line. And it, it, Bell, Bell's logic was, we're born with a voice. We communicate primarily through our voice. This is the system that we should be using to communicate our voice. And so, just as a, a stat on that, it looks like yeah. by 1930, there was 40 by 1930, the start of the Great Depression was 40 percent, just about 40 percent of the households had telephones, had telephones in the home. And, yep. you know, cars were also not really accessible. Most people transported by uh, public transportation. I think the cars were merely actually, symbols for hope and future uh, hope. Actually, and a, most and a people try. Most people, because most people were rural, rural in that uh, time uh, frame, most people actually uh, transported by foot and horse. Uh, about 80% of uh, travel was by foot and horse in the United States at that era. Uh, and a lot of people, it, people were not coagulating in cities. That was the uh, Yeah, that was, that the was really. And so the it, first major event on the, on the Great Depression, as, as looked at, was the, I think the high was a th 381 on September 30th was the, the peak. And it wouldn't return to that high for the next 25 years, which is pretty, pretty crazy if you think about it. Yeah. O October 24th of 1929 was the F Black Friday, and the stock, park, uh, stock prices immediately fell 11%. Wall Street went crazy, uh, and that really led to a slide, a continual drop. And I think it was in 19, the, the, so not, that was later that year, December of 1929, 650 banks failed, which is just, just crazy to think about. And as banks failed, it reduced the money supply because there was less credit available. And that meant that every dollar was worth more. And so as the value of the dollar rose, prices fell, and that reduced revenue for businesses. It also meant that debt now costs more for lenders to pay back. And this created a ripple effect of the personal and business bankruptcies, which really vibrated, right? Because now it's everyone's thinking in a, in a mindset of scarcity and where am I going to get my next, you know, not just paycheck, but meal on, the, on, on, your, <laughs> on your table. And the reaction, so now let's, you, you brought up this really good framework for thinking about the uh, sequence of events as initial event and then reaction well, and then synthesis. Well, the, the, the basic reason I brought up communication is it magnified uh, a couple of things in the mind of the average person. The beginning of the 1920s, uh, there was a lot of optimism. The reason why it was the roaring 20s is the economy and the middle class was expanding really more rapidly than anybody could have ever imagined. It was a phenomenal, <coughs> excuse me, phenomenal period of time. Europeans were just floored over this concept of, of, of a middle class because really up until this point in time, there wasn't one. And so in the 1920s, we created the middle class. We also created the optimism that somebody who had lesser means uh, could actually rise above and, uh, and, and, and maybe be far more advanced uh, than their parents and prior generations. So and it was looked at as material wealth, right? They, they could have a lot more. They could have more comforting things like refrigera car, house, refrigerators, yeah, refrigerators uh, hot water, real machines. toilets. Real mm -hmm. toilets. So, so the uh, the industrial age uh, and and an automobile. Ford was trying very hard to create a, an environment where the car was affordable. So all of these things conspired, but the telephone is often never cited as one of the trigger events of uh, uh, the um, depression. Great depression. Um, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So, and so here's one of the reasons, and it's sort of a thesis I put together a long time ago. It's been verified by a lot of uh, a lot of things. There's a couple of things that conspired to it, but one of the ones uh, I'll bring up right at this moment is the ability for the average person to communicate their message further than they ever were before. You got to remember, prior to the invention of the telephone, the average person's their voice could only go as far as 
a handwritten letter. And even though there was a lot of letter writing, it, it, it was it was a, a process that required steps. It was a process that had a lot of cognitive and mechanical load. The telephone ultimately became a cheaper form of communication when it came down to the ability to transfer information very rapidly and people to act on that information. The delay of a letter, sometimes a letter would take 14 to 27 days to get to um, uh, to somebody from even, uh, you know, 50, 100 miles. It was not fast. There were Pony Express, things like that, but average people didn't have access to it. Telegraph, uh, of course, was available, but it was uh, actually a, a very costly up until uh, the mid-1920s when they were really hurting financially. It was a very mechanical system. I mean, you think about what's involved in the telegraph, and even with multiplexing and, and uh, frequency shifting, there was... Uh, very little that one could do to improve the telegraph lines. And it, uh, funny enough, the telegraph industry had the opportunity to buy out Bell uh, just when he was selling out. And he said that there's no hope for this form of communication. And that was, uh, you know, uh, early uh, early 1900s. So when when individuals made an investment, a couple of things that started happening is the average person saw that uh, people were getting wealthy in the stock and come out of these markets. That's number one. So that allowed people to start opening their eyes to saying, how can I do that? At the same time, investment companies were opening up branches in areas that they usually wouldn't have to try to capture the potential market because the speculation was growing. So that's number two. Number three, people, when they made investments, told their relatives and they generally used the telephone, say, buy into this company now. Here is a great investment. Uh, prior to this, there was no instant network effect on stocks. That created an overheating effect in the stock market uh, that a lot of very wealthy individuals at the time made note of. They're saying, wow, these people were investing. They told one friend. They told 10 friends. who told 20 friends. And all of a sudden, there was speculation. And there were some people that were seeding that speculation, too, obviously. Uh, people who were trying to take advantage of these stock swings. It's the first time that we really had this on a grand scale. The final icing on the cake was uh, leveraged investment. You put down a dollar and you control 20, 50, 100 shares, uh, but you took the loss of 20 or 50 or 100 shares, even though you took the gain of 20, 50, 100 shares. The stock market kept going upwards. The optimism was clear. The newspaper headlines were exceedingly optimistic. The folks that were driving the stock market industry were optimistic. Yet, in the background, they were pulling their money out. So, essentially, what had happened to the late 1920s is the momentum of the stock market was fueled by the network effect of the telephone, the network effect of radio, TV, books, magazines. And that essentially overheated the market to the point where just about 90% of the exceedingly wealthy individuals in the United States were out of the market. Yeah, um, well, that's interesting. That's a, that's a good point. If you look at it from a from an alien's perspective, it's the first time that technology, something that I'll define technology here in the sense of it, it, it involves electricity. It's the technology. It's electro technology yeah. has played a significant role in in society at large. And and not to say that the events of Morris Code weren't big during the war. I'm sure they were, and there was other periods. But from the perspective of the economy, of just collective well-being and concern, the, the, uh, the electro-technology of the telephone really started to have a heartbeat. Like it was a tool that drastically changed how how information was communicated. But what that does is ripple changes across society much faster than they otherwise would. And we're talking about a time period of human existence, you know, being hundreds of thousands of years, etc. And that that all throughout that time frame, there's this natural dampening effect where information, good ideas, bad ideas can only be spread through people. And there's it, it takes days for ideas to spread through society or weeks or even months. And because that time period was drastically shortened, you could get ideas out there in hours or minutes. There was this like 
condensing of the effect or amplification exactly. of the effect of something happening. So a small um, a small trigger or a small maybe three banks failing wouldn't have necessarily put the economy into a complete crisis mode had there not been telephones. But because people were able to communicate with each other so quickly, everyone's scared. And now everyone's telling everyone else they're scared. Exactly. It exacerbated that's, that's, the that's entire – And also, yeah, we were effect. talking – technology I, mean, I had no, a big there, one there, there's there's one more point i want to make about the technology sure. um anybody listening to me go and look at the history of the great depression you will not see anything about the telegraph or telephone this is relatively unique information but it's extremely important information because it applies to where we are today and in and, and very unusual ways um on top of the telephone there were individuals that were sort of well, well, actually, a sideline to this. <clears throat> Newspapers and radio were also using the telegraph and telephone to transmit news and information. And like Mike said, banks were failing. And usually bank failures were not actually a very large big deal. Uh, banks were failing all the time throughout history, and people survived. There are techniques for survival. Oh, yeah. Exactly. I should mention there was there was 24,000 banks. So earlier I said 650 of them failed. While that is a lot for one month, obviously, it, it's yeah. not all of them. It's not all of them. But what happened was the sentiment, the sentiment that was usually only localized became nationalized. This is an extremely important element that we cannot miss. All news is local always has been and essentially always will be. If you really distill news down to its ultimate kernel of truth, it actually only affects relatively few individuals, but the sentiment of that news is wide ranging and can be hyper magnified and hyper extended. And we're living through the extension of that right now. So when banks started failing in, you know, Chicago and, and, and San Francisco, the newspapers that most people read, which were local newspapers, a vast majority did not live in cities, they started getting news that they would not otherwise have gotten. And that was saying banks were failing. And that started some folks to say, oh boy, I wonder if my bank is doing all right. And if anybody wants to go back to seeing that era, you can look at it, uh, you know, some of it in a, in a wonderful, it's a wonderful life. Uh, it's a great movie to show you savings and loan versus banks and, and, and the whole concept. So people started to do runs on banks and the bankers would say, hey, there's nothing going wrong here. We didn't invest in the stock market. You guys didn't invest. So banks started liquidating and having runs uh, because they were they were granting savings. And loans so this is people. Primarily. Everyone's going to the bank to try to get their money out because they're scared that their bank might collapse, too. Because so there's of these news, pictures of long lines because of news that didn't even apply to them. The same thing was true about farming crises. There were a lot of farming crises we talked about uh, prior show, and a lot of them had to do with over farming and not natural resources. It was a lot of it had to do with the way people viewed industrial farming and the concept of fertilizer. And that news started to spread through the newspaper because of the telegraph and the telephone. And so small newspapers in towns that had abundance of food started creating the mentality that there wasn't enough food. Oh yeah. Then, let me, let me comment on just a couple, uh, a couple interjections. So 1930, June 17th, president Hoover signed the Smoot Hawley tariff act, which raised taxes on 900 imports. It was originally supposed to help farmers, but ended up imposing tariffs on hundreds of other products. And as countries, uh, retaliated, setting off a trade war, which is <laughs> never a good thing. And as a, as a result, the international trade began to collapse. So that, that, that in and of itself is just an interesting concept to understand. So for today, if you think about you know Trump and the trade war that's talking about it, this was a direct negative impact when countries start to increase the money they take out of businesses trading with each other. It's a, just a tax on their own people. And that tr a trade war is just amping up the, ta the taxes, the tariffs. Uh, higher and higher and higher. And so that month, a drought actually hit 23 states from Mississippi to the mid-Atlantic. And it was the first of what was later called the Dust Bowl drought, the worst in 300 years. Sure. And as crops failed, farmers so, couldn't produce enough to eat. And, and there was you know the idea of the fertilizer being a, a tool or technology to help farmers. We ended up hurting them because they couldn't produce food at the same time. 
uh, frequency as they could or destroyed their land. So, and, so let, let's 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 stop for the for the farming scenario. What happened with the farming scenario is over farming. Uh, the only reason we had a dust bowl was not primarily because of drought cycles. They happen all the time. They've always happened in human history. The reason why it was so pervasive was the information given to farmers in that epoch, 20 to 30 years, to continue to farm the exact same commodity over and over again. And instead of allowing the land to return back to a, an off state or a reset state, uh, to use fertilizer to just push it a little further. The problem with that concept is it destroys the topsoil. It destroys the topsoil so much that even if there's a slight drop in rainfall, which is really what that drought was, it was a you know a 12 to 14 percent drop in rainfall, which is really not a drought in in anybody's regard. Some people you know exaggerated the 70 percent drought. It wasn't. The reason why you see dust and a dust bowl because there was no topsoil left. The topsoil got ripped away and sucked up into the air and spread around the world. And essentially that happened because of over farming and overproduction of the land. That stuff kind of still goes on to a certain extent. So again, stupidity, manufactured, I'll let people decide what happened in that epoch, but natural effects weren't the only cause. They were one of the causes. There's another thing that um, you won't read very much about, and that's the work of Edward R. Dewey. Uh, Edward R. Dewey was um, uh, hired by the U.S. government to study in the 1930s, to study the Great Depression. And he's a scientist and a, a statistician. They had no computers at the time, so he had hundreds and hundreds of calcul human calculators to try to figure out not the cause, but how did the Great Depression happen? And one of the things that Dewey discovered, which he really didn't want to discover, was there are uniform cycles throughout everything humans do and everything throughout this world. And these are immutable cycles. They always happen, irregardless of politics, anything. There are, there are long-term, short-term, and micro-cycles. And he said that the Depression was finely tuned to a financial cycle also a political cycle, and, they cons and also a farming cycle. He was able to detect a, a series of cycles that he does not explain, nor has anybody successfully explained it today, other than, let's call them debunkers. The debunkers will say, oh, there's no cycles, it's astrology all over again. Well, that's not an explanation, by the way, and it doesn't go anything to examine the cycle. The cycle exists, the cycles always exist, and Dewey was one of the first uh, individuals to publicly speak about cycles. Prior to that, uh, cycles go all the way back to um, pre-Sumerian times and Egyptian times. Is Dewey can... the same guy from the Dewey Decimal System? Nothing to do with him. He's Edward R. <laughs> Dewey. Uh, look him up. He wrote uh, The Mysterious Forces That Trigger Events Cycles. And uh, his book is a classic. It should be read by every high school student in economics and science, both economics and science. Uh, his work has been tested. Uh, it's been verified. And um, if he only had access to computers, uh, I think a lot of his uh, um, work would have been even more Interesting. Uh, yeah, I think I actually, I think I heard his name from Ben Bernanke, who was uh, the chair of the Federal Reserve, who studied, I think his PhD was on the Great Depression. And he had some comment on Dewey, or, or he just mentioned him as one of the more influential thinkers during that time period. People that, you know, you study, when you do a PhD, you read everything on the topic of the Great Depression. And you read historians who were both there and who had studied it later. And you live either through people who are still living today, which is very few, uh, or you live through people who wrote stuff down. Uh, and yeah, it's interesting to think about the people who wrote stuff down and studied that time period while it was going on, because they're the ones who preserved yeah. the actual facts of the situation. You know, what, what was really interesting is Dewey, although his most of his work for most of his lifetime was not publicized or very well known. Uh, he, he finally did produce a report. It conclusively shows how the depression happened. It's very rarely talked about. Uh, but you know, he influenced many. I mean, um, uh, a guy named Copley armor, uh, conducted a uh, study in the 1930s 
uh, with uh, biologists from around the world, 25 top biologists, and he was studying biological cycles, you know, fur trappers in, uh, in, in Canada, uh, the migration of geese, all of this. He found over 49,000 cycles that were reproducible and predictable. And again, nobody's trying to examine how or why these cycles exist, just that they do exist. And um, the so do it. <laughs> yeah, well, but the cycles are, are important because they explain even today why certain events are happening and how they're happening. Not why they're happening, how they're happening. It's very important to discover on your own the difference between why and how. Most of us are, tor- are taught to try to believe that the why is the answer. And the why is not necessarily the answer. You may never get the why, but you can get the how. If you get the how, you have power. A lot of the, the folks that have made a tremendous amount of money during the Great Depression and prior to the Great Depression, otherwise known as robber barons, they understood that there were cycles. They understood that there were cycles in everything. Uh, this is again ancient wisdom, ancient. Well, also, knowledge. I mean, they just, I mean, also to just to understand, cycles are one thing, sh- sure, to look at. I'm not, I'm not denying that, but also there are realities of just a, a system and how the system is structured. So, inflation has a certain influence on the economy. The number of people Which is working a cycle. have an influence. Sure, Which sure. Is you, a cycle. You, it's just what the, that's one lens to look at it. So you can say that there's a certain ratio of uh, Federal Reserve interest rate to job creation. And if you tweak one, the other happens. Uh, so let's let's continue on with this. So we have in the June June of 1930, this was when the tariffs uh, were increased. The world goes into an international trade war. Drought hits 23 states. Uh, it's kind of a, a tough time period, to say the least. President Hoover asked the Red Cross to help out, and as the crisis worsened, uh, Congress approved $65 million worth of seed, feed, and food boxes. Uh, later that month, it, the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs was established. And uh, at that time, too, the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve was a banking system composed of two thirds of, or sorry, one third of the nation's 24,000 banks. So as the d- different groups of banks uh, were tr- effectively trying to make calls on the, on the, holdings that they had for people in those banks, uh, debitors rushed the banks to pull out their, sa- their savings, these you know people who own bank accounts. And so yes. it was this cascading um, pull of you know actually having the money in reserve versus having debt out to people. And this is the same general structure that's occurred in 2008 when people try to pull money out or you know the subprime mortgages when you loan out a ton of money to everyone, but no, there's no actual money in the system to represent what is loaned out. And you know, that's, that's part of the Federal Reserve banking system. But at that time, it was a pretty new concept, given that the Federal Reserve was only 12, uh, 15 years old by that point. Mm-hmm. So many of these ideas just were new. So you could put an idea out there and not know how it reacts. And, uh, and you, get a, you get a system you know, of trial and error to some extent. So by late 2030, uh, many of the banks had failed. The fourth largest bank in the nation, the largest <clears throat> bank failure at the time, uh, happened with the Bank of the United States. Unemployment rate was up to 9%. Deflation was, I think, at 6 6.5%. So it was really a pretty tough time to be around. 1931, food riots broke out. You know, people were really starting to think about starvation as a a thing to protect against. And it's difficult to try to imagine that in today's world because we're so far removed from that reality. Uh, so this is really in the in the midst of it. It was a 10-year event, which is just just crazy long time. Yeah. Um, and so 1932, uh, Congress created the Reconstruction Financial Corporation to lend $2 billion to financial institutions to present, prevent further failures. So one mechanism that 
humans used at that time through Congress effectively was borrowing from the future. So creating money into the system to try to stimulate the economy and to try to get us back to a stable ground. And I'd say my, my general thought on that, I'd be curious, curious to hear if you have a debating point, but it, it seems like that worked pretty well. Like that was an effective use of uh, creating debt from the future to pay for solutions in the current present moment. Um, it slowed down the bank failures, it slowed down the inflation, it slowed down unemployment rates, and it seemed to then cause momentum in the, in the positive direction. Well, yes and no. Um, you know, the best way I can, I can say this is that once a problem exists, we, um, we elect individuals whose job it is to legislate and create laws, right? So when there is a crisis, we look ab above to our elected officials and say, help us, there ought to be a law. And it always starts with the best of intentions. And the idea is people need food and they're hungry and they're hurt right now. Again, technology magnified this effect. There are a lot of folks that were unimpacted a lot of folks were unimpacted by the Great Depression uh, in a lot of ways. They did not have no job uh, prospect, uh, future outlooks, those types of things. They had jobs. Um, they had ample food. They had access to transportation. Their life was unaffected, but their sentiment was being modified because of technology. That technology was the printing press of um newspapers and magazines, the radio, early versions of it, and the telephone and telegraph to a lesser extent, mostly the telephone. So relatives that lived in New York who, who uh, had friends and family living in Ohio or something, um, they would call their, you know, their family in Ohio and say, we're starving here. There's unemployment lines. And they're like, our farm's doing great. We have great food. And milk. <laughs> yeah. Come out, right? Come just out. Such, everything's such a fine. class of the world. It, yeah, and and it's very easy to get caught up and lost. This was primarily a failure of that, that version of the industrial revolution, and the failure came not just because of the way the industrial revolution was organized around big cities. Uh, you know, forcing people in a small area because there there was a mean for, means for production there. It was also the financial instruments, uh, the leverage uh, that others were using were, were, were granted to the average person who unfortunately did not understand the downside. Uh, they understood the upside that they had control of 20 shares, but they didn't realize they had the loss of 20 shares. That's how people lost money on speculating. And, and a lot of folks, that was the dog that bit them. There were a lot of folks that come from that era that would, not, would never use credit and would never invest in stocks because, it, you know, in, that, in the back of their mind, study it, they said they, they put their money in something that was foolhardy. And it took really until the 1970s and 1980s for that generation to start re-investigating uh, uh, the idea of individual um, investments and things of that nature. So there's another thing that's really important to understand. It wasn't the first panic. The 18, 1873, a lot of folks don't go very far back. 1873 had a similar impact, but it had a different effect. One of the things that didn't exist was a telephone. Another thing that didn't exist was relatively you know, non-information uh, from non-local sources. Newspapers were more or less local. All the news you read about was what took place down the road, what took place uh, within your county, and a few uh, things like that. You might get three or four-week-old news for about you know, international things and uh, mm, maybe yeah. a week old news from something that took place on a national yeah, level. News is definitely much faster. So, so that magnifying effect of news is really the thing that's affecting us today 
in in our Twitter and Facebook world. Oh yeah, it's the same level of amplification that just happened. I mean, but it's is, different. It's about, different. It's it's different. It's different. Sure, but it's the same effect. It's the same same effect. General it, amplification of like now you have peer to peer in less than five seconds, and everyone's doing it all the time too. But everybody has to because information is coming at you so fast and so uh, so un, unremitting that you have to start trying to have an instant response to it. And so what you have is the hot take. And everybody's sort of proud of their hot take. And it's usually something humorous or something that goes to a paradigm that they've established of the world, a worldview. So if they see a certain name, their hot take is, yeah, I expect it. And they, it goes down the road. Um, you know, there was a student wearing a red hat looking at a Native American. And immediately the hot take was, this is what happened. Turns out it wasn't what happened. We are all being manipulated by the instant hot take response, cause and effect response that's that's happening right now. And it's a relatively new thing. It took 50 years for individuals to get over the effect of technology that oh, helped yeah. cause I mean, the great and, and technology depression. was a critical part of this. It took 50 too. years. You know, another, to, another, to, another to, critical. How to deal with things. And oh, yeah. I'm not and sure it, if it's going to take maybe a hundred years for us to get over yeah. this technology is information an, where we see technology pictures. is an enabling component. It's not the, it's not the cause and there's never oh, no. one cause and it's not one, you know, one thing. Another it's thing an we didn't talk about is uh, the prohibition. So the prohibition going from 1920 to 1933 was a key part in, I think the social culture at the time, alcohol had been part of, you know, human civilization for a long time. And there's mixed reasons as to why the prohibition was brought about. You know, some high level ideas were that it would reduce crime, it would make the nation healthier. You know, whatever the reasons are, I'm sure we could. Debate it was those. a social. But the, it was a social control system that sure, we sure. we know but better than you do. Is the really the end of it was a a really useful. Uh, a freeing of effect. You know, t- it was really uh, 1933 and March 20th, the Government Economy, uh, Economy Act cut government spending on finance to the deal, which would um, effectively bail out the banks at the time. And it, what's interesting is two days later, the Beer and Wine Revenue Act, it's just you get a sense for how much regulation was being created during this time period. I mean, it was like like large, large monumental uh, influences of society that propagated for decades were created during this short window of only a few months. So yeah. uh, March 20th of 1933, the Beer and Wine Revenue Act ended prohibition. And what it did is it, it allowed uh, taxation on alcohol sales to raise revenue for local business. Businesses. And if you think about alcohol as one of the, you know, it's a, you can comment on whether it's good or bad. And just like anything, if it's consumed in the right dosage, in the right setting, it can be a really enjoyable, useful experience. Uh, but it allowed people to, I think, relax into the situation. You know, I'm sure there was alcoholics and it created a sense of, you know, there's probably mixed views on that debate, but it did allow taxation, and the taxation was revenue, revenue for local businesses, and it uh, helped fund the school system to maintain public schools. Uh, on March 30th, 31st, so j- just later that month, there was uh, uh, the Civilian Conservatory uh, Conservation Corporation was launched to hire three million workers to maintain public lands, public public schools, and public lands, which were uh, you know really influential. And Roosevelt also at the time, this is a bit of a tangent, but he was the one who really uh, established the National Park Service. And his mother and his wife, I just watched a documentary on this last night. His mother and his wife died the same day, and yeah. he wrote that after that moment his light from his life was removed and he went into the forest and he was with john uh mir Muir. yeah Muir. Muir, yeah (laughs) i always mispronounce his name slightly and he you know from that experience realized wow the treasure of the country is in these beautiful parks and establishing that really gave rise to this hope and optimism for the the beauty of the country and I think it was, I'd argue that that was one of the first kind of turning moments in the Great Depression, just cogn- socially and, and cognitively from the group collective consciousness. And um, 
the gold standard was also an interesting influence on society, to say the least. This is one of Faisal's favorite topics. So I wish I could yeah. be here to comment on it. But the FDR on April 19th stopped the gold run by abandoning the gold standard. So he ordered everyone to exchange private gold for dollars and effectively just having you know, the paper be the value that it is, which is the system that we have today. Uh, May of that year, 1933, the Federal Emergency Relief Act created more federal federal jobs, which is also a tool to try to stimulate st- the economy to some extent as you have more people employed uh, by the government paying them with debt from the future. It starts to create a sense of stability in society. Uh, the, the Again, same month, the Emergency Farm Mortgage Act provided loans to save farms from foreclosure, which... Who knows if any individual decision was a good or bad influence, but it had an influence. Uh, of June of that year, the government stopped repaying dollars entirely from, from loans. Uh, there was a few other acts, namely the uh, National Insurance Recovery Act, the Glass-Steagall uh, Act, which was part of the investment banking and retail banking at the time. The Emergency Railroad Transportation Act, which you mentioned earlier, coordinated the national railway systems. Uh, And then only a few months later, the uh, dust storms of Oklahoma and surrounding states uh, were were disastrous to the farms at that time, just adding to the the challenge of all all of it. And apparently it says here that, that in our notes that the farmers slaughtered six million pigs to reduce the supply and boost prices, which yep. is just just a, a crazy kind of twisted phenomenon that happens there, you know. Well, uh, it, it's, it's it's interesting how history records that um, commodity prices and farmers were always at odds with the investment bankers and commodity brokers of Chicago and New York. And during the Great Depression, what was going on was a driving down of commodity prices artificially. And uh, one could argue after looking at the evidence that the United States government was also participating in this. Farmers were struck with a problem. And I don't say it's the right solution But one of the ways that they dealt with an overabundance of commodities was to try to sit on it longer. And one of the things that they thought that they could do with uh, the price of uh, pig bellies and uh, bacon was to uh, slaughter the the animals. Now, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's the simplistic overview. And we got to remember, we were primarily an agriculturally based society in that period of time. And oh, hugely. Was, yeah, hugely. Yeah. And, and there was a big give and take between the financial centers and the farming centers. And um, uh, the financial centers ultimately won. Uh, they broke the farmers. There were millions of independent farmers in that era. And uh, one would argue that they were dumb. They didn't know what to plant. The government was telling them what to plant and what to grow, and they were subsidizing it. They were not dumb and they were not ignorant. They were extremely uh, talented at what they did. Uh, the end effect of over farming and, and, and raising the wrong animal uh, was that the farmer lost, even though uh, they were subsidized, they ultimately lost uh, because on the long-term effect is it commoditized the pricing to become too low. So how, did they, how were there too many pigs? There was motivation for them to raise more pigs than they should have. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. This is where I think acts and regulations get kind of a, like th- this is the reality of it, right? Where they, they get introduced with all the great intentions, but then they create an economic system or just a, a operational system that doesn't make sense. It's exactly. Because the incentives are kind of skewed or they're not genuinely to produce a, a free market good for a consumer who's going to pay you directly for it. And, so so what yeah. so what happened with the pigs is th- they were going to have to bring pig to market at a cost about 50% lower than what it costs to raise that pig. And so imagine a very independent mind farmer not very happy with the bankers and the politicians that cause this problem saying no you're not going to get my pig for half of what it cost me to raise it. 
So now, again, in, in the grand scheme of things, did that help or hinder? I, I don't know. But there is reasons why this happened. But, you know, there are other great things that took place in this year, the Hoover Dam and some of these great. Oh, yeah. Let me let me let me kind of catch this up and then we'll, we'll wrap up pretty soon here. But a few big events that happened during this time period as well was the uh, the minimum a uh, minimum age, the minimum uh, wage was established. <clears throat> A minimum age too, also because uh, minimum wage, yeah, the child work. labor was at the same point. Min, uh, minimum age to work, and the limited work day to eight hours. So there was a lot of we see that today as just being the the nature of the the work environment. But that was that was when it was established. You know, J- June of nineteen thirty three. Prior to that time, there was no minimum wage. There was no uh, child labor laws. There were no fixed hours or overtime concepts. Uh, these are these are all a function of the Great Depression. Uh, 1934 was a big year. That was when. Uh, sorry, this was 1935. I think was the the really significant year. With just listen to the number of uh, large acts that were passed: the Soil and Conservation Act, the Domestic Allotment Act, the Rural Electrification Act, which helped farmers generate electricity for their areas, National Labor Relations Act. Social Security Trust Fund was was brought about. There was just so many things that were introduced during these few months that I, I can only imagine what it was like. Uh, 1936, it was the hottest summer on record. Eight states experienced temperatures at 110 degrees or hotter, which is just, it's just crazy, you know? Um, As throughout it, the there's year, there's a cycle to everything. <laughs> yeah. 100, 100, 1,700 people died directly from the heat in Texas. Yep. 3,500 yep. people I mean, drowned, just (laughs) trying to cool themselves off. Uh, And FDR raised the top, so imagine this, the top tax rate going to 79%, which is just... Yeah, I mean that 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 is that is wild. I never I didn't realize we were at that high of a tax bracket yeah. that early. But you know um, the the interesting part about the tax rate is that it really only impacted the middle class and not the high class. And, and, and a lot of people argue about this, and I just say empirically look at it. The the very 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 wealthy uh, already had their money in trusts, offshore trusts, and they were not taxed. And let's look at it today. There are companies in, in the United States. So the largest, I mean, I think Amazon pays zero U.S. taxes, and I think they got $17 million back from the U.S. government this year. Um, the same is true with very wealthy individuals. You know, what's interesting is we're having these same communications and debates today. I'll let anybody decide who those people are. Uh, and it sounds really good. Let's tax the rich. And the, the reality is the ultra-rich are never impacted by this, ever. They never have been and never will be. And you can chase them around the world. There are always there are always yeah, places yeah. where they can where they can go. So that that marginal tax basis actually hindered entrepreneurialism. So essentially what happened when you started raising the upper tax basis, there was no incentive for the average person to have an art, entrepreneurial enterprise because as they got more and more income they were getting more and more tax to the point where it was almost uh, a no-win situation. And entrepreneurialism didn't get un- unleashed until the 1950s. And th- when the, the tax rate went down to, I think it went down to 18% for the wealthy. I, gotta, you know, I, I wasn't prepared to, for this. But it went down really very mm-hmm. rapidly, mm-hmm. very quickly. And that started a inventing entrepreneurial craze that led all the way up to the 1970s where it got high marginal tax rate where it slowed down yeah and then it exploded again in the 1980s so, so uh, just yeah it has, just a, gonna... it has a, a direct correlation to entrepreneurialism always absolutely yeah so just kind of wrapping up here the 1938-1939 is when uh hitler invaded poland starting world war ii and and actually in, in sort of a in, in a way, twisted a series of events. The World War II was a stimulus to help the United States out of the Great Depression. And uh, the economy grew 8% in 1939. Unemployment fell to 17%. Uh, debt rose to $40 billion as we borrowed more money to fund the war. Uh, the defense budget grew uh you know the top ta- top tax income rate grew to 81%, which is just crazy. Uh, FDR began his third term 
And I'd say really coming to a close here, the the last kind of big event, I, th- I think, was December 7th, 1941, Japan bombing Pearl Harbor. Congress declared war in Japan. The economy grew 18 percent. Unemployment plummeted to 9 percent. Prices rose. Debt debt grew naturally. And then 1954, which is you know 10 years later, the Dow closed at 382, which is the first time uh, it exceeded that 381, which we talked about at the start of the show on September 1929. So that kind of brings us full circle from the late 20s, 1929, at the high of uh, 381 until 1950, which the Dow returned there. And there's so much during that time period I'm sure we could spend hours on. But I feel like this is a really good overview of some of the more uh, significant and influential parts and in, in observing how the culture was at that time and what people thought about. Uh, so, yeah, Brian. You know, a, 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 couple of, a couple of points just uh, before we close it off. You know, I think what's really important to understand is that there are always other influences to any historic event, and it's not always easily discovered. Um, I, I don't want to call this hidden history. It sounds conspiratorial. Let's just say uncovered history. And as you start researching almost any subject, you can realize that there is a lot of different layers that impacts such as a technology impact on uh, the Great Depression. A lot of folks don't think about that. Or, you know, the the give and take of the uh, top marginal tax rate. I mean, you know, we, we, we just spoke about it, but, you know, just before World War uh, II, it was nearly 98%, you know, 98% marginal tax rate. So, uh, you know, a whole lot of things had to, had to change for people to want to get out of a nine to five job and to try to live what was really considered the American dream. And it wasn't until the seventies where we started seeing a 70 and then obviously Reagan dropped it down uh, to ultimately what came to be 40 and and, and 20%. But all these things are, are are themes that have cycles. And if you look at Mm -hmm. the, at the grand theme of things, we're going back to an upward cycle. There's no doubt about it. And, one could easily see where all of this goes. Yeah. There's nothing new under the sun and how, uh, on how financial cycles uh, are a big part of yeah, the economy and as well. flows happen. And anybody listening to us, you know, we, we try to give you a leg up. We, we helped you with Bitcoin. If you listen to us in our first shows, hopefully you did well because Bitcoin was only about, I don't know, 60, $70. It's terrible. Now it's only at $4,000. Um, you know, Hopefully you listen to this and you realize that the things that you think are just now new or just now happening and there's no precedent. I promise you the only thing that's wrong in that statement is that you're not looking hard enough. History offers a tremendous amount of value. And when you realize that there's a cyclical nature to history, then as you see the chaos around you, you now have a context to understand it. And, and a lot the patterns. of patterns. Yeah. And a lot yeah. of work that I do with, with folks and a lot of the consulting. I yeah. Do you really do is, put out a lot of great work on this, whether it's Quora and Twitter. Yeah. I, I, I try yeah. to show people that there's no mind reading involved is that you just need to understand context. And then what does that give you? You don't need a hot take. You don't need an instant response. You don't need a quip. What you need to do is take a step back and say, there's a news event taking place right now. Is it really yeah. unique? Is it really unique, or is there something else? Yes, yeah, there that's a pattern before it. Yeah, Brian, pattern? this has been a this has been an awesome conversation, and it really is is a great way to think about the world. And uh, yeah, I hope our listeners valued the Great Depression as an act to learn from, and look forward to the next conversation, Brian. This has been fun. Awesome, thank All you. Right. It's a great time. Bye. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the hosts, co-hosts, and guests appearing on the show and do not necessarily reflect the view of the owners and producers of the show. Paid advertisements in form of audio announcements may appear throughout the show, including this one. Advertising can also include print and other digital formats. The owners and producers of Around the Coin do not endorse or evaluate the advertised product, service, or company, nor any of the claims made by the advertisement.
all programs are subject to a one-time charge for professional editing fees for which the interviewing guest or guests may have contributed towards. The owners, producers, hosts, co-hosts, and guests on the show are not financial advisors. Any investment advice or opinion cited during the show is for information purposes only. None of the content is intended to be investment advice. Seek a duly licensed professional for investment advice. If you believe there's been any violation of your copyright, trademark, service mark, or any other type of intellectual property, please inform us in writing by sending an email to legal at aroundthecoin.com.